I'm not going to read you a speech. Um, you probably wouldn't listen. I'd get really bored. I've, I've spoken at over 4,000 events in the last 32 years, and I speak in high schools. This is what I do. I'm not going to talk with you as kids. I don't think you would listen. The school doesn't pay me to come. I'm going to be with you for a, a few minutes. We'll talk. Then I've got about four more events today before I hop up on the plane and fly back to Chattanooga. So if I spent all the money that I spent to come up here, and you, you're getting out of class for this period, or however long you're out, I want you to understand that I'm not talking with you as just to fill a date. I really believe we're here because there's something that we can get accomplished together. I'm going to ask you to do three things. I'm going to ask you to think. I'm going to ask you to listen. And I'm going to ask you not to talk. I'm going to invite you on a journey that I could probably make you laugh a long time. I know I can make you cry for a while. But I'm not interested in moving your emotions. I'm interested in moving your heart to the point where you can actually think about your life. These are, this is not your typical assembly. Um, there's a lot of great speakers out there, and I hope you get to hear some great speakers today. I'm going to tell you my story. I'm going to tell you some stories I've heard from students just like you in public schools, in private schools, in Christian schools that I've shared and met um, from Russia to Australia to South Africa to England to all over America, I don't know how many times, and now today here in Evansville. I'll start off by telling you that um, when I found out I was going to get to come back to your school, I smiled because I remembered your school. I don't think that I got to speak to any of you or very few of you last time I was here, so I'm hopeful that what you're getting ready to experience will maybe ignite something in your heart that will allow you to uh, take off a little bit on this journey and maybe stop, maybe stop looking at yourself as a kid and maybe start thinking about your life as it really is, and that is someone who has the capacity and the potential to do something with your life that can be transformative. Potential is your ability to do something. That's what you've been given. You've been given potential. The most unused potential anywhere on the planet is in a cemetery. That's when it's too late. When you're looking at someone, they're, they're, looking, you know, they're not looking at you. They're six feet under, and you go, well, they, you know, their potential. Their potential just got buried. You have the ability as a young person today living in this country to go to places where most people around the world that I've met never get to even attempt. You have opportunities here that most students that I've met in other countries never, ever, will ever have, but you, for whatever reason, do. And I will say to you with very strong conviction that to whom much is given, much is required. I didn't understand that when I was your age. I went to a private prep school. I went to a, a school called Macaulay. It was, it's one of the top 10 prep schools, all boys. It's in the state of Tennessee, and I hated it. I mean, I enjoyed the experience, but I didn't enjoy the schoolwork. I had, I had four hours of homework every night. It was nonstop. And most students don't have four hours of homework every night, and I was, I was living under such immense pressure to perform that it just wasn't, any, it wasn't enjoyable. And so I, at 15 years old, I, I, I had changed schools. I was now in a school that I was thriving. I had, you know, great looking girlfriend at 15 years old. I was playing sports, played quarterback, taught tennis, played golf. Life was great. Everything was going really well for me. But at 15 years old, on a Wednesday afternoon, at 4.45 in the afternoon, I was sexually abused. And 60 seconds changed my life. And I made a decision. And the decision was this. I will never tell anybody what happened to me. And so I just pushed down the emotion, I pushed down the pain, I pushed down the corresponding shame, everything that you can think of when a person goes through when they've been abused sexually, whatever that is, experience is, I experienced it at, at a very high level. And I just refused to deal with it. So at 17 years old, as a junior in high school, I failed PE, not because I wasn't athletic, I just told you I played quarterback, taught tennis, played golf, I failed PE because I was not going to change clothes in front of anyone because of what happened to me 24 months earlier. My coach said, Dean, if you don't dress out, you'll earn the F in my class. I said, coach, you're not going to fail me. I mean, look at my, you just, I'm, you need me. He was like, Dean, I don't need you. I will fail you. And if you do not pay the price, you're going to find out. Where I went to school, our parents had to sign our report cards. I had algebra, English, history, civics, PE next to PE. I had this F leaving me standing in my principal's office. When I got it, I went to the coach's office and he said, Dean, I don't know what's going on with you, but I told you if you did not dress out, I would have to fail you. I said, Coach, I'll do anything, push-ups, sit-ups, I'll run laps, I'll go to the stadium, I'll, I'll go up and down stadiums, I'll do whatever you tell me to do. I can't take an F in PE home. He said, well, I'll tell you what, let's start all over tomorrow morning. I said, you have my word on it, which meant nothing. My drug of choice was lying. I lied more than I ever told the truth. You had to catch me telling the truth I lied so much. Why? I didn't like me, and if I didn't like me, you couldn't like me, and so let me create an image that I think you'll enjoy. Didn't work. Because you see, the only true, authentic person that you can really, genuinely connect with is yourself. And I ask students this question, how authentic are you being? 
Are you the real you? Are you the purest version of yourself? Or are you trying to measure up to some type of social status that says you've got to act a certain way, dress a certain way, talk a certain way, do a certain thing? Do you have what it takes on the inside to be the original version of you, the best version of you? Interesting question. Well, my coach said, Dean, I want your dad's signature, not your mom's. I said, all right, but what about this F? He said, no, 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 that, that F is yours. You earned it. Come back tomorrow morning. Well, that's when we're starting over. But this one is yours, your dad's signature. I went home that afternoon. My dad looked at my report card. He said, Dean, you've done really well here. I said, Dad, you're, thank you. Just sign it. I got to go. He said, no, 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 no. It says here you failed PE. There's no way to fail PE. I said, Dad, there's a way to fail PE. He said, are you telling me that you failed the easiest class you will ever take? I said, yes, sir. He said, do you want to talk about it? No, sir. <laughs> he said, let's talk about it. Yes, sir. The two po- most important lessons I learned in that conversation with my dad was, was this. I never again felt PE, but the more important lesson that I've shared with, already with you today and with, with millions of other students, if you don't pay the price, you will pay a price. There are no free lunches. Go forward five years, four years, 21 years old, sitting in my office. I have whatever society says makes you successful. Money, a couple of airplanes, great looking girlfriend, all the stuff, and my life was miserable. You can gain everything the world has to offer, and if you don't have it right in your heart, I think you're in trouble. I was sitting in my office one day, and I was dialing a phone, and as I was dialing this phone off behind me to my left, I just knew I had this prompting in my heart. I needed to call my mom and check on her, so I dialed 3447443. The phone rang six times, seven times. On the eighth ring, my mother answered the telephone, and when she said hello, I knew instantly there was something terribly wrong, because in that moment in time, sitting in my office, when I knew I was supposed to call my mom, and I did so, my mother was attempting suicide. Whether she's your best friend or your worst enemy, somebody you see three times a day or three times a year, when you're here and 25 minutes away on the other end of the telephone line, the lady who gave birth to you is literally dying, that will change your life. It becomes a defining moment. And every single person here and those who are watching, I promise you, you will have a defining moment in your life that you will be time stamped as that's the moment my life changed. It can be something very, very powerful and positive or it can be something very, very challenging like I went through. I ran out of my office, jumped in my car, drove up Interstate 75, Got to my parents' home. From the outside in, everything looked fine. It was safe, secure home. From the inside out, my mom was dying. I stood in the back of this auditorium this morning, and I watched you walk in here by the hundreds. And I watched, and I, and I, and I noticed that there were three types of people walking in. First, type, first group that I saw, those of you who walked in like you actually owned the auditorium. Like, I'm here, everything's great, there are no issues, and you, and you had people following you, and you sat down. The second group, those who just went, if I could just get to one of these seats and blend in very quickly, nobody will even know I'm here. Then my favorite group, the guys who are watching the girls walking in going, do you think they know we're watching? Let me help you. Yes, they know. (laughs) I beat on the door at my mom and dad's home. My mom was barely alive. She comes down some stairs. She falls into my arms. I pick her up, carry her to her car, drive her to Park Ridge Hospital. And on the way to the hospital, she said a sentence I'll never forget. She says, Dean, I can't be dying. I said, Mom, you're not going to die, but you're going to have to choose to live. And ladies and gentlemen, the most important word in that sentence is not live, it is choose. Your choices, my choices, our choices create our circumstances. If you don't like your circumstances today, check your choices. Doctors began to work with my mom. They threw me against the wall. They rushed through the emergency room. They're now working with her. My dad's now there. Family and friends have arrived at the hospital emergency room. 45 minutes later, this ER doc walks over to my dad, has the most bewildered look on his face, looks at my dad, shakes his hand, and says this sentence, Mr. Sykes, there is no medical reason to tell you what I'm getting ready to tell you. It is a, quote, miracle of God. Your wife is alive. You can go see her. I heard that sentence, and I was like, my life just changed. She's alive. She made it. She decided to do something with her potential, my mom did, and when she got out of the hospital, she made this choice, and the choice was this, I want to make a difference in the lives of other people. She went back to school, became a doctor, and for 30 years, she helped people come through what she had come through. Why do I say that to you? You, I believe, have the opportunity to discover your purpose. It's not yours to decide, it's yours to discover. What is it that makes your life special? Not any better, not any worse, not not any more grand, grander than the person sitting next to you, but what is it that makes you uniquely you? For me, I can speak. This is what I do for a living. Give me a microphone and an arena full of people and, and I can go with you on a journey. What I can't do though is play baseball. I'm horrible at baseball. So I don't even, I don't even really attempt baseball anymore because I just, I don't get it. My point is, find out what is your thing. What is it that causes you to want to do? This morning, 
I was so excited to get up here. I mean, I was awake at five o'clock in Chattanooga. I was like, man, I, in four hours or five hours, I'll, be get, I'll get to be with more students. I could hardly wait to get here. I share a lot of what I'm sharing with you with other, other schools. And I was in this one school and I was, I was in an auditorium much like this, except it was packed. And when it was over, a young man walked down this long aisle towards me and he had about 10 or 11 guys with him. And he got up to me, shook my hand. And there are two words that I will say to you today before you know, if you don't get anything else out of what I say, the two words are you matter. And that means that your life really does matter. And if you were not here, we would all be missing something very, very uniquely special and gifted. And so this young man walks up to me, he says, he said, hey, and told me his name. I said, hey, I said, I'm Dean. He said, I really enjoyed your assembly. I said, hey, man, thanks so much. I appreciate it. I said, you know, you're a leader. He said, how do you know that? I said, well, the fail-proof way to know if you're truly leading anyone is to look over your shoulder and see, if, does anybody follow you? I said, you've got about 11 guys, if I'm counting right, that are following you. He said, yeah, I'm the, I'm the quarterback of the football team. I said, that makes sense to me. In fact, he, he then stopped. He said to his guys, he said, hey, I need to talk to the speaker by myself. I'll catch you at lunch. They walked off very dutifully. They just like went out the side door towards the cafeteria. And I said, see, you're leading and you're just standing here. He said, you asked some questions at the end of the assembly today. And I did. And I'm, I'm going to ask you some questions at the end of this assembly. And he said, I raised my hand to all three. I said, wait a minute. Time out. All three? He said, yes, sir. I said, tell me about yourself. He said, he said well, here's my, he told me his name again. He said, I'm a high school junior. Got a 3.8 GPA. Dating a great looking girl. Playing for the state championship this Friday night. Everyone thinks we're going to win. I said, yeah, but you, you raised your hand about suicide. Tears filled his eyes. He said, I did. I said, what could be so bad about your life? 3.8 GPA, come from a great family, quarterback, playing for the state championship, dating someone. You're very popular. You're, clearly you're a leader. What is going on? And he looked at me with these tears in his eyes. He says, you don't get it, do you? I said, help me. He said, you cannot imagine the pressure I live with every day to perform. And when he said those words, pressure to perform, it stopped me. I was like, man, let's talk about that. And he began to tell me his story in, in greater detail. And he began to tell me what it was like to be him. And then he said to me, he said, can I give you something? I said, sure. I have students quite often give me things at the end of assemblies. And he reached into his pocket and he pulled out a 12 gauge shotgun shell and he handed it to me and he said, today at 315, which was literally 240 minutes from that moment, because it was 1115 when he and I were talking, he said at 315 this afternoon, I was going to the 50 yard line of the football field, not to throw football, but to end my life, because that's where I perform the most and I can't do it anymore. He said, but you told me that my life matters. I said, man, your life does matter. And if you weren't here, we would all be missing something so dramatically, just unimaginably great. Not because you've got a 3.8, not because you're dating somebody, not because you come from a good family, not because you're the star quarterback, not because you win the state championship. You are of value because you're breathing. Simple. I get him some help. He walks off and I, I go on and more and I, I share that, that story, what I just shared with you, I, I share with a lot of students across the country and I'm in a convention in Texas. It's actually a Christian convention. There's a couple thousand students there, and I get through speaking. I've shared some of my stories from the road, some of the students that I've met, some of what they've shared with me. And I go to our table, and at our table, we have T-shirts and books that I've written and just stuff that, that teenagers like to get. So I'm, I'm, I'm meeting a lot of students who are coming to me after, after, after I'd spoken. And I noticed at the end of my table, there's a young lady. And every now and then I'll just kind of glance down there and she is locked in. And here's one of the greatest lessons I've ever learned. And I learned it from this 14 year old kid. And she said this to me as we were talking, I finally got it. It was like this. It's not that she wanted to talk. It's that she needed to be heard. It's not that she wanted to talk. It's that she needed to be heard. Many of you right now don't even know it, but you're nodding at me like, yeah, you get it. And what I get amazed at is when you don't even realize you're nodding. Let me just pause a second. I want to just say thank you. Clearly you're listening. Clearly you're not talking. And clearly you are thinking. And I appreciate it. So at the, after all these students leave, this young lady who's still at the end, our eyes connect. And she starts moving down towards where I was standing. I go, hey. She goes, hi. I go, my name is Dean. She goes, I'm Megan. I said, Megan, I have a daughter named Megan. We call her Maggie. That's nice, she said. My name is Megan. Okay, Megan it is. 
I said, Megan, how old are you? 14. What'd you think tonight? I really liked your message. Thank you. You told me that my life matters. It does. Do you believe that? I said, no, I don't just believe it. I know it. You don't know me, she said. I don't have to know you. You don't know what I've done. Don't have to know what you've done. She said, how can you know that my life matters? She said, I'm not really a good person. I said, it's not about being good or bad. It's about your breathing. We can work on, you know, things that we do. But you've got to recognize the value that your life has. And we began to talk some more. She said, can I tell you my story? I listened to you tell me your story. I said, Megan, I got plenty of time. Talk. I want to hear your story. And man, she began to tell me her story. And at 14, I'm, I'm just standing listening to this 14-year-old young lady. I'm like, how could all of this have happened to you at 14 years old? You know, today's teen, when I started speaking in schools, it was 32 years, five months, I'm sorry, 32 years, two months, and seven days ago, long before you were even thought about. The things that I dealt with 32 years ago on the road are benign in comparison to today. You can't imagine what it was like 32 years ago when I started filling up places like this. They didn't deal with what you're dealing with. Social media wasn't even a thing. The internet had just literally come online. First convention I did had 600 students in it and three had cell phones. Let that freak you out for a minute. Imagine your life without a cell phone. Imagine not even knowing what a cell phone was. So Megan and I keep talking. Can I tell you my story? Yeah, she told me her story. She then says, can I show you my, my arm? And she, I said, well, yeah. She pulled her sleeve back and right through here, she had been cutting and it was vicious. I said, Megan, why do you hurt yourself? And the answer she gave me is the same exact answer I get from every teenager I've ever asked that question to, no matter, what pla no matter where I am on the planet. The same exact sentence, verbatim. I hurt myself to stop the pain. I hurt myself to stop the pain. So we go from, hi, I'm Megan. You told me that my life matters. Can I tell you my story? Can I show you my arm? And then she says something a little that got my greater attention. She said, can I give you something? And at that moment, I'm thinking, okay, here we go. Because when a student says, can I give you something? I know to get ready. What I wasn't ready for is she pulled this out of her book bag. And I carry it with me wherever I go. And that's her blood stain, razor blade. That's her blade and that's her blood. And I carry it with me and I show it and I get the same response I'm getting right now. And it's because it's real. And she said to me, I don't want to hurt myself anymore. Will you please take this? I said, absolutely, I'll take it. I shared that story at, at a Native American Indian school where I was speaking. The place was packed and I, I wondered when I was finished, I thought, did anybody get anything out of what I just said? There was no real emotional response whatsoever. I get through, I'm walking out, a young man stops me, he goes, can I tell you my story? I said, please tell me your story. He goes, you told me my life matters. I said, your life does matter. He said, thank you, it changed my life. He said, here, and he handed me a, 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 a little black box. I said, what is that? He said, it's a lighter. I said, I, I don't smoke. He said, I don't either. I said, I don't get it. He goes, I used this lighter, and he clicked it, and it flame showed up to burn myself. Why? To stop the pain. What does all this have to do with you today? In today's teenage world, wherever I go, Los Angeles to New York, Chicago to Fort Worth, New York to South Florida, and all points in between, the number one issue that I encounter every single day on the road, public school, private school, Christian school, prep school, alternative school, prisons, wherever we go, the number one issue I encounter are teenagers who have become so hopeless that they actually believe their death would be a better choice than their life. What I did not tell you was 22 years after I'd been sexually abused at 15 years old, married, three kids, two dogs, German shepherds that are just, you, you would not want to come on my property, unless I'm there. These dogs are, they're serious dogs. They're, they, they're there. I do too. I love shepherds. They're just the coolest dogs, but they'll also eat you. I go to a Home Depot. I walk in, aisle 17. I walk down the aisle, turn right, and I walk right into the person who 22 years earlier had abused me and my life unraveled. And here's what I learned, and here's what I share with students. If you don't deal with your emotions, your emotions will deal with you. I told you about 25 minutes ago when I started, I wasn't going to talk with you as kids. So let's, I want to save at least five or six minutes if you want to question and answer. So let me start bringing this in for a landing. I was asked this question, and the question was this, will you forgive the person who hurt you when you were 15? And I said, no. 
Why? They said, I said, it's not fair. What do you mean it's not fair? I said, well, I didn't do anything wrong. I, I got hurt. And they said, you know what would happen if you actually forgave the person who hurt you? I said, what? And their answer stunned me. I didn't believe it at first. They said, if you'll forgive that person, you'll get free. I said, I think I am free. They said, no, you've got so much pain on the inside of you. You know, if I were to bring a trash can right here, right now, and you began to just push the trash down and keep pushing it down and keep pushing it down, eventually common sense says if you keep pushing trash into it, you know what's going to happen? It's going to overflow one day. It's no different with your heart. If you just keep pushing the emotions down, you keep pushing the pain down, you know what's going to happen eventually? That emotional thing called your heart is going to have an eruption, and when it happens, I've, I've got that T-shirt, it's not fun. I said, let me get back with you. It took me three days. But after three days, I said, yeah, I'm going to choose to forgive that person. And I did. And you know what happened? Exactly what I told was, was told was going to happen. I got free. Our outreach in schools catapulted into the stratosphere. Suddenly, I started getting phone calls. Our office started getting phone calls to go, I mean, all over the place to tell what I'm telling you. Forgiveness. Big deal. But if you live with unforgiveness and you, you've got some real pain in your life, pain seeks pleasure and hurting people hurt people. So show me a teenager who's really hurting. I'll show you somebody who's probably hurting others or are really hurting themselves. And then you go through a thing in life where maybe you feel like you've been rejected. And on the other side of rejection is a word called acceptance. And I lived that life of being abandoned emotionally by my mom who, from four, when I was four and a half years old for, forward. She just basically abandoned me. She was there in my life, but she just abandoned me. You know what? You can't give what you don't have. So not only was I sexually abused, I was emotionally abandoned, and I had all this rejection on the, on the inside of me, and I felt like I, I couldn't measure up, and I felt like nobody really cared. And, and, I, and the more I tell this story, the more students come up to me afterwards and go, man, you're telling my life story. How did you know? It's not that I know, it's just this is what, this is what we encounter. So if a person lives with unforgiveness in their heart, they feel like they've been you know, rejected or abandoned, they feel like they've got all this pain, they don't really see a way out. You know what happens every day in America? These are not my numbers. These are the, something called CDC, Center for Disease Control out of Atlanta, Georgia. This is what CDC tells us. Every day in America, 5,600 teenagers your age attempt suicide. Every day. While I'm talking today. 5,600 kids. 5,600. In an arena that seats 12,000 people, that arena would fill up every two and a half days with teenagers who in the previous 60 hours bought the lie. And so I'm on this unimaginable journey to help students realize, what would your life look like if you really got a lot of unforgiveness in your heart? What would, you, what would it look like if you forgave somebody who hurt you? What would it look like if suddenly you went from being rejected and abandoned to being accepted? And what would it look like if suicide really was not an option? Because suicide is built in threes. A person will first think about it. Secondly, they'll talk to someone about it. And third, if they're not stopped, they attempt. What's all this got to do with you? Maybe you don't, maybe none of that even remotely reflects your life, or maybe it does, or maybe it reflects maybe someone in your life. But I came here today to say to you two words. You matter. And if you weren't here, golly, would we all be missing something. And students say to me, you seem to really care. Oh, God, I do, I, yeah, I do care. Why? I've met so many students who've been in such agony and such pain. But I've also met so many students who've been in, on top of the world like, man, my life is great. I'm, I'm not dealing with suicide. And that's wonderful. I spoke at a school. The schools you've seen on television, I've spoken at. Schools have had school, the shootings where students have been shot and killed. I'm one of the guys they call. I've been there. I've stood where students were, sta were standing in a circle, 32 kids holding hands, praying before the school bell rang in a public school. A young man walked in, a freshman, had a book bag over his shoulder, had 1,200 rounds of ammunition and five guns. 32 kids said amen, dropped hands. He put an earplug in either ear and began to fire. And 11 seconds later, eight students were hit. Three young ladies your age were dead. The principal said to me, you say whatever you want to say. Just give us one word, hope, H-O-P-E. That day I went to that school and I stood where that slaughter had happened. And I, and I looked around and I thought, man, why? Why did this happen? And I went on that stage and I spoke to a lot of people. The television cameras were rolling and photographers from newspapers were there and reporters were catching it all. And when I got through speaking, and a young lady rolled up to me in a wheelchair and she says, thank you for what you did not say today. I said, who are you? She said, I was one of the students they carried out of here on the day of the shooting. I said, I know you, I've seen you on Good Morning America. She said, that's me. 
I said, what's your dream? What do you want to do? She said, well, it's changed. And she told me what she wanted to do. And we talked. And one of the reasons I'm so big on forgiveness is this young lady wanted to walk again. And she was in a wheelchair and she couldn't walk because she had been shot. And her thing to me was, she says, Dean, would you pray for me? I said, yeah, sure. People all over the world prayed for her. She said, her principal called me one day. She said, he said that she's out in California in physical therapy. She's getting stronger. She walked across stage on graduation day. She since walked in a marathon. And I wanted to know why. I believe prayer was answered, but I also believe this. That young lady chose to forgive someone who hurt her. So, it's time to make a decision. I asked three questions. I told you earlier that I had some questions I was going to ask near the end of the assembly. I asked three questions and only three. I don't invite you to get out of your seat. I don't invite you to come forward, none of that. I do ask you to do two more things for me. You've done the first three. I've asked you. You've done it very respectfully, and I genuinely appreciate it. I wish I could take you all into a lot of schools that I go to who aren't nearly as well-behaved as you are. I was in a school in Florida, and there were probably a 1,000 students there, and I literally had the police had to come to escort me off the stage because there were, some of the students were just totally, completely out of control. Went to another school, a Christian school. When I got there, there were four police cars, and they were hauling students out the front door and in handcuffs because of drug ring in the Christian school. So I do see quite a bit. So here's what I'm going to ask you to do before I get out of your way. You go back to do whatever's, whatever's next in your life. Would you do two things for me? Would you, would you close your eyes with no one looking around? Because I don't want anybody to watch you. Because my three questions are pretty intense. One at a time when I ask the question, if, the, if your answer is yes, all I'm going to ask you to do is raise your hand. Because when you raise your hand, you acknowledge something. And when you acknowledge something, I believe you're almost halfway there to winning the battle. Because recognition is a big deal. When I said something about forgiveness and feeling rejected, it felt to me like, man, we just hit, hit the mother load. Some, that was something that needed to be discussed. When I say three, with no one looking around, please, with your eyes closed, if you would say to me, Dean, there's someone in my life who's really hurt me, and I, maybe just maybe today I'm willing to take a chance like you did to forgive that person. Do you have to go to that person? I didn't. I just dealt with it internally, and it worked out okay. On the count of three, if you would say to me, there's someone in my life that's hurt me, I need to forgive them, and I'm willing to take a chance and do so. When I hit three, would you raise your hand? One, two, one, two, three hands. Thank you. 70% of you. Second question. Rejection. Ooh, that's a big word. A person who feels rejected doesn't feel like they're enough. A first person who's been abandoned emotionally feels like, what's wrong with me? I thought about it through the years, thought, what could a five-year-old kid have done? What, what could I have done at five years old? to have been emotionally abandoned by my mom. Maybe you know what that feels like. I can also tell you from very, very personal experience that on the other side of rejection and abandonment is acceptance. And man, that's a great place to hang out. On the count of three, if you feel like you've got that rejection inside of you and you would love to get to this thing called acceptance, one, two, one, two, three. Good gracious. Okay, you can put them down. Here's the hardest question to ask. Nobody looking. You're doing really great. This is my last question. This one is the hardest question to ask and the most challenging to answer. It takes more guts than anything I would ever ask a student to say yes to, but it's a big, big deal. Suicide is built in threes. I told you that. A person will first think about it. Secondly, they'll talk about it. Third, if they're not stopped, they attempt it. If today you're sitting here in Indiana and you would say to me, you got the guts to say to me, suicide's a real option. Like I said, recognition's half the battle. We've got a lot of free follow-up material that we have available on our website. It doesn't cost you anything. There's counselors around. There's teachers around. I'll be around. Just people that you can at least start a conversation with. People say to me, well, if I come up and talk to you, people, they think I want to kill myself. No, they don't. Maybe you want to talk about my German Shepherds. Maybe you want to talk about the airplane sitting out at the airport. On the count of three, take a deep breath, because here we go. Here's my last question. And I know you're here. The pounding you have in the center of your chest, I got that same pounding in the center of my chest. I know you're here. On the count of three, every single day that I do this, literally scores of students raise their hand. Suicide's a real option, and you got the guts to say so. One, two, here we go. One, two, three, hands up, please, where I can see them. You can put them down. Open your eyes, look up here, we're through. Teachers, just so you know, 27 on the last question. That's the 27 who had the guts to raise their hand. There's more. There's always more. So what do you do about that? Well, I got a couple of things. Like I told you, we have resources 
I'm not a counselor. I don't try to be a counselor. I'm just a guy that speaks, that knows how to connect with students. I've written 32 books. Those books are follow-up. If you happen to enjoy how I speak, you will love how I write. It's very casual. There is a card we're getting ready to hand you, and on the back it shows you what you're signing. It's this pledge, it's a pledge card, and I ask you to sign it because if I took you to lunch today and I pulled out my credit card and I paid the bill, when I sign my name, what am I doing? I'm taking responsibility for what I've just signed. It's mine, I'm gonna pay the bill. When you ask students to sign their name to this pledge, what I'm asking you to do is take responsibility for your life. This says, I choose to live and not end my life for three reasons. I was created as an original for purpose and for relationship. We've had over 100,000 students so far sign this card. When you sign it, I invite you to tear the bottom portion off. You, you keep the top portion, give me the bottom. On the top shows you what you're signing. On the back, it shows you what's next, some things you can do next that would be very helpful. Joseph. At the, after we sign this, Joseph will walk you through it one more time. We have these bands that, that we have that we love to give to students. It's got our website address on it, just youmatter.us, and it's got a reference on there that it's very personal to me. If you're interested, and please don't take one if you're not going to wear it, but if you want one and you'll wear it, I'll just give it to you. I want to thank you again for letting me come into your school. I want to thank you for listening. You want to talk, I'll be around. I know they've got teachers here, counselors here. We're here for you because your life really does matter.